Gabe Miller here. I want to personally thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. And I also want to encourage you to click the subscribe button so that you can stay current with all of our content on here. You can connect with us also on our website at yourimpactchurch.com and on all of our social media outlets at Your Impact Church. I hope this message encourages you, inspires you, and challenges you. Let's jump into the message. Well, good morning. Good morning. We are excited about marriage night this coming Friday. If you haven't gotten registered, we have a lot of couples that have already registered for that, but we are going, we're just going to have a good time together. How many of you believe if you're married, come on, where are all my married people's at? Married people's, married people's, yeah. If you're married, it's good to invest in your marriage, and whether you feel like, man, we're on the mountaintop or we're in the valley, it's good to gather together and just, we're going to be able to encourage each other and hear some some special teaching and uh, things that I believe will be an encouragement to you. And we're going to have a good time together and eat together. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So this Friday night, 6 o'clock, right here in this room, uh, we're going to be hanging out together. So if you haven't registered, go online. Uh, it's only $25, as you heard, and we would love to see you here. And today, we have a very special treat for you. Uh, last weekend, we ended our series on Devoted. And uh, today, we have Nathan and Kelsey Brindle are in the house with us. Come on, the one and only... Nathan and Kelsey Brindle, and uh, I believe you're going to be blessed. They are missionaries to Papua New Guinea, and you're going to hear a lot about what it is that God has called them to do and uh, opportunity for you to be able to partner with them and us to be able to partner with them as a church. And so we have a quick video, and then after this video, he's going to come up and share a little bit with you, and so I'll allow him to do that. But hey, turn your attention to the screen and watch this video. Hey, my name is Nathan, this is Kelsey, and these are our kids, Simeon and Sienna. We're missionaries from Heber Springs, Arkansas, and we're moving next summer to the island nation of Papua New Guinea. different languages on the island of Papua New Guinea. And the majority of those are still unwritten. Many of these people groups have no access to the gospel. They have no churches in their area, no believers who speak their language, nothing. And many of these tribes are begging for missionaries so that they can hear what they call God's talk in their language. Our goal is to establish a mature church among one of these people groups in Papua New Guinea. So when we move overseas, we're gonna spend the first six to eight months orienting ourselves to the culture and the language. And then we're gonna move into a remote travel location to accomplish these five things. First, we're going to learn their tribal language and culture. And this is so that we can translate and accurately share God's word in a culturally relevant way. Second, we're going to create an alphabet and then teach them to read and write their own language so that one day they'll be able to read God's word for themselves. Third, we will teach chronologically through God's word from beginning to end so that they will know who God is and why they need a savior. Fourth, we'll translate the Bible into their language. And this is so that they'll have scripture in their language for generations to come. Fifth and finally, we will disciple and appoint elders and teach them in outreach so that they can go and reach those around them. But we can't do this alone. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit and the prayers and support of the body of Christ. God is doing great things among the unreached people groups of Papua New Guinea, and we can't wait to be a part of it. Good morning. Am I muted? No, I'm good. All right. Good morning, Impact Church. How you guys doing? Um, like I just said, my name is Nathan Brendel, and my wife and I, we are on a journey into tribal missions to be church planners among an unreached people group with an organization called Ethnos 360. And we'll be moving to the island nation of Papua New Guinea this summer. This July is our plan. And before I forget, we have a table in the back that 
we have a place that you can sign up for our newsletter so you can keep up with our journey. And there's prayer cards and a pamphlet about our ministry. And I say that so I don't forget. Um, but first, I want to just say it's a privilege to be here with you all. It was incredible that the elders invited us. It was a God moment that the elders invited us to come and share with you all. And so I hope I want to share about our ministry. And I hope that woven throughout we will see God's heart for missions together. Let's pray. God, thank you that we can be your body no matter where we are, no matter who we're with. If we are with your followers, we are in good company, God. God, I pray for people who have not heard about you yet, for the many people that have not heard that laborers would go, more and more laborers would go into your field. I pray, God, that to, for this service, that I wouldn't just be a parrot saying the same things, but that you would speak and that your word and your truth would be known, God, and that you would speak through me. And I trust you, God, in your precious name. Amen. There are three billion people in the world who have yet to hear the word of God. And many of these people live among unreached or unengaged people groups, meaning they have a unique culture and language. It also means that there are no active churches working among these people. Or it also means that there are few, if any, believers who speak their language and can present the gospel. And a large portion of these people groups, these unreached people groups, are on the island nation of Papua New Guinea. There are over 850 different languages, like we said, on the island, and that makes it the most linguistically diverse country in the world. And so these people, they live in very remote tribes, in the deep in the jungle, and they are only accessible by either helicopter or days and days of hiking. And so because of this language diversity and because of the difficult terrain of Papua New Guinea, many people still have not heard the gospel or had to, a chance to understand it. But it's not only that. There are many people in Papua New Guinea that live in fear every single day because of their animistic beliefs. Let me give you an example. Um, this is the people of Hewa. That was the people that you saw in the video. And in 2015, my wife got to go visit the missionary family living among the Hewa people, this extremely remote tribe. And the missionaries said that when they first moved in, the people put up a front. They wanted Hewa to look like Eden like they had every single thing they wanted just by living off the land, and they were at peace. But it took a while for the facade to slowly come down. See, the people, they wanted to keep the missionaries in the dark about what they really believed. But then the missionaries, through learning their language and slowly learning their culture, they began to realize the depths of their belief system. The people of Hewa, they were not at peace. They were terrified of an elaborate set of spirits and sorcerers that dictated nearly every single decision of their daily life. So for example, no Hewan could go out into the jungle and hunt alone. That would never happen. Because if he did, he would be eaten by a spirit and he would die. And no one could ever sleep alone either, because if he did, the spirit would see him and eat him in his sleep, and he would die. And the Haywins, they believed this to be the truth. There was a young man who told the missionary when they moved in that he could count 75 people who had died in his lifetime that confirmed this to be true. And Satan was working in their world to confirm the lies that held them captive. I mean, that isn't God's heart for his image bearers at all. That's not how he wanted his 
people, his creation to live. And that's just the surface. These beliefs, they get darker and messier the deeper you go. And my wife and I, we are burdened by this great need to shine the light of the gospel to these people. And so we've trained for four years to be tribal church planners and go to one of these people groups so that they can hear about the light of the gospel. And so we hope to move over there and learn their language and their culture and then teach them to read and write their own language because these languages, they are not written down. And then we will translate the Bible into their language so that they can have it for generations to come and we will teach them all of God's word. And then we'll stay to see the, these believers come to maturity. See, our goal as the church, it's not just that the gospel would go out. That is the start, and it is part of our commission, but it is just the beginning. I want to, be share, I want to share with you guys from Colossians 1.28. And it says in 1.28, So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God mature in their relationship to Christ. See, that means that they are growing in their understanding of how their relationship with Christ affects everything. And this is the same commission that Jesus gave the disciples in Matthew 28. It says in verse 18 that Jesus said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So first go, and then teach them to obey all of my commands, all. So our goal is to see body believers firmly grounded in truth of the scriptures and loving one another in truth and serving one another and carrying the message of God's grace to those around them and to the world. And that's maturity. And I believe it ought to be the heartbeat of every follower of Christ. But how do we get from a people who are terrified, living in animistic beliefs about the spirits and sorcerers, to a God-glorifying, Christ-exalting community growing in faith and love and truth. So my son, Simeon, he's two years old, and he absolutely loves to cook, and he especially loves to bake bread. I will get it on the table and he'll just pound on it like it's Play-Doh and he loves it. And he also, he recently, he learned how to open the refrigerator and he knows how to get into the pantry now and he knows how to open every single drawer in our kitchen. And so he's learning a lot. So if I said to him today, all right, Simeon, you're doing great. You're in charge of cooking for yourself now and feeding yourself. I think he'd probably go hungry. Or worse, I think he'd get seriously hurt. I mean, he's just two. I can't, we can't imagine Simeon cooking for himself right now. It's going to take years, of just years for him to cook for himself and lots of mistakes and lots of teaching. And we can't imagine the go preaching the gospel to an animistic tribe, then leaving them as infants in Christ to just figure out the rest on their own. See, we've seen what happens to the church when maturing in Christ is not the goal. In Papua New Guinea, there is a strong pull towards materialism. The people live in poverty. Most people live in poverty. And so they're looking for ways to get rich quick. And there is a belief system called cargo cult. And it's where they see the church as a way to get cargo, like food and money 
and medicine, and machetes and beer. They believe that if they listen to the missionaries and add Jesus to the list of spirits that they worship, that they will get stuff, that they will get cargo. And there's false teachers that have gone around and preached messages of coming shipments of cargo if they just believe and add Jesus to their beliefs. See, their focus is no longer on Christ at all or what he he did. They are focusing on what they can get by appeasing him. And the American church here in America, when maturing in Christ isn't the goal, it can look different. I was reading a book December, and it was a really good book. It's called Replenish. And it talked about how the church can slowly morph into a corporation where the goal is about efficiency and numbers and well-organized social programs to serve itself. And I've watched it happen to churches that I love where their goal was about numbers and not engaging the congregation in personable, tangible ways to help them grow to maturity. See, those are good things. But when believers are meeting to serve themselves or gain a blessing, they're missing their very purpose, which is to experientially know Christ and worship him with their lives. So the Apostle Paul He wanted to present everyone mature in Christ, and that is why he wrote the letter of Colossians to the infant church of Colossae. See, Colossae, it was neither a large or important town, and Paul, he had never been there. But there were believers there, and they were young, and Paul in prison, he wanted to encourage them to find their fullness in Christ. Find Christ who lives in you to be their everything. He wants them to become mature in their understanding. And so he expresses his goal in verse 28. And I'll read verse 28 and verse 29 again. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God mature and their relationship to Christ. And that's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power who works within me. So Paul, he expresses his goal, his mission, his drive, his purpose. And it's to tell others about Christ through warning them and teaching them until they become mature. So a warning here it makes clear the consequences of an action or an attitude. And when I read the word warning, I immediately think of intense hellfire and brimstone preaching, but that's not what it's saying here. A warning, it's about creating real tension in someone's life by allowing God's word to lovingly show them the truth about Jesus and where it comes into conflict with our life. See, Paul, he saw it as his responsibility to proclaim the entire message of the gospel. And so throughout Acts, we actually see examples of him doing this and Peter and Stephen. And these examples, they always begin in the Old Testament, laying foundations about creation and the law and Israel and then the message of the prophets and about the coming Messiah, then Jesus and his righteous life, and his anointing of the Holy Spirit, and then his suffering, and his death as a payment for sin, and his resurrection to new life, and now the sending of the Holy Spirit to all who believe in him, and his imminent return for the, to rescue the church, and judge the world, and usher in his kingdom in its fullness, and finally the restoration of all things, This is the gospel. And it's one of the reasons why we as a mission, we teach the people chronologically. We want to lay strong foundations upon which the gospel stands. See, the integrity of the message, it's dependent upon a solid 
understanding of the whole story of Scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit. So seeing people come to maturity in Christ, that's what drove Paul. The word mature, it can be translated perfect or complete, but it's about finding your fullness in Christ. And so he says in verse 29 that he is working hard towards this goal. And that means he's putting in blood, sweat, and tears into seeing people grow in their knowledge of Christ. And he does this through God's power, through Christ living in him. He wanted everyone to experience the depth of knowing the Savior. And so that's his purpose in writing Colossians. He wants people to know and find their life in Christ. So where does the road towards maturity begin? Well, Jesus, he modeled discipleship for us, walking and living and teaching and warning his disciples and raising them in truth. And the thing is, the disciples, they really didn't get the gospel for quite some time, but they lived with Christ and they followed him, and they learned from his example. So maturity starts with discipleship, and that can happen before we ever present the gospel. For my wife and I, before we ever even learn the language, it can look as simply as walking down the jungle trails, holding hands together. In Papua New Guinea, most husbands they don't care for their families. They treat their wives like property. They see them as property. And so when they see my wife and I loving each other and caring for our families, that strikes them as different. It stands out and they wonder why we live this way. What drives us to be kind and loving to one another? And so as we set out to learn their language, we will do it by spending time with the people in their jungle gardens, in hunting with them and around the fires, wherever they are, we want to be there with them. And we hope and pray that our lives before we ever preach the gospel will be a model of Christ's love before them in our family and our coworkers. And that one day they would be able to look back and say, Oh, I get it. See, discipleship is a lifestyle. This means you never stop reflecting and representing Christ. You are intentional with every single, single interaction because you are an ambassador of Christ's kingdom. So for our family, modeling discipleship, it continues through every aspect of the church plan. After we learn their language and their culture, we will develop a literacy program and we will teach these people how to read and write their own language. And we'll pay attention to who is really getting it, who is understanding how to read, and we will train those people up to take over the literacy program to teach their own people. And we will continue to pass the baton in every stage of the church plant until we work ourselves out of a job. So maturity, it must begin with God's word, and it starts with understanding God's story and where you fit into it. And it's important to have the strong foundations in God's word and recognize it as our authority, because then we can grow in our understanding of how to practically apply truth to our lives, in our culture, in our ever-changing life. So the missionaries in Hewa, they learned the language, and then they developed lessons. And they began to teach the people beginning in Genesis all the way through the ascension of Christ and an infant church was born. And now there is a thriving church among the people of Hewa. And for our brothers and sisters, when they first heard that God was the one who created everything, it challenged how they, how they thought. See, if God was the one who formed the trees and the mountains and the rivers and the sweet potatoes and the pigs and the fish, well, that meant that it belonged to God, not the spirits. See, God 
God's word, it challenged the very way they saw the world and the very way they thought. So when believers understand their identity, that Christ lives in you, we will live differently. See, growing to maturity, it's about seeing yourself and understanding yourself more and more the way God views you as his blood-bought children. And so for our brothers and sisters in Hewa, this was clearly visible. They were no longer afraid to walk down the trail alone. Why? Because Christ's spirit lived in them. And if God was the one who created the mountains and the rivers, then they're safe. The spirits aren't going to eat them. And they even started to build their houses different. They used to make their houses with this double layer. Um, down low, you can see that first layer of bark. And then up high, you can see that cross hatch. And they built their houses this way to keep the spirits out of their house. But it also meant, because of how tightly woven that second layer is, that they struggled with asthma from their, the smoke from the cooking fires inside their homes. And so now the believers, they build their houses different because they aren't afraid. They build their houses so it's breathable and they don't struggle with asthma in the same way. But these changes, they didn't just happen immediately after they heard the gospel. These changes, they weren't sudden. It took years of intentional life-on-life -life discipleship and studying God's word in order for these truths to affect their lives in practical ways. So another way we see maturity is just in the life of the church and the life of the church community, how they're growing together. See, part of maturity is, maturity is recognizing that we need community. So recognizing that God has knit them together as the body. See, are they growing together? Are they gathering together? Are they remembering what Christ has done? Are they loving one another? Are they remaining steadfast under afflictions and trials? See, all these, they're signs of a maturing and thriving church. And there's a lot of ways that we can picture and talk about maturity, but put simply, it is living in the fullness of Christ. So some of our friends, they're missionaries to the Wantakia people in Papua New Guinea, and they had hiked 18 hours to another village for a local rugby game. And there, um, some friends, uh, Jason, Joss and Jason, church elders in a neighboring language people group called Aziana, had hiked three hours to just encourage these missionaries using the trade language to communicate. And so an Ethnos 360 church planner, he had finished the, Bible the Aziana Bible translation in 2004. And now there's three healthy churches with mature elders there. And the Aziana Church, they have a heart to see the Wantakians, their former enemies and murderers, reached with that same message of grace. So our missionaries, they sat down with the tribal church elders of Aziana. And Jason, he pulled out his Bible, and he looked a little nervous. And he said, I have a few things that I'd like to share with you all. We've seen a lot of missionaries come to Papua New Guinea over the years, and you are all very well trained, which is great. But we've also seen many of you leave before the work was finished. Some had a hard time learning the language, and some got sick. If something horrible happens, like if one of your children die, you cannot go back to America and leave this work before it is finished. And when tragedy happens and comes upon us, we have nowhere to go. I can't buy a plane ticket and leave the Lord's work unfinished. Jason said, God has marked me to carry on his work in Aziana, and I cannot walk away from it. If our children die or another tragedy happens, we must continue on the Lord's work. And opening his Bible, Jason read from 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. It says, dear friends, do not be astonished that a trial by fire is occurring among you, as though something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, 
so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice and be glad. Then he paused and he closed his Bible and he looked at each of my friends in their eyes and he said, these verses have brought me much comfort. Two days ago, I buried my youngest daughter. She was only a few years old and she drowned in the river. Several children had gone down to wash and they didn't watch the youngest well and she drowned. And I've buried three of my children, but I cannot leave the Lord's work unfinished. With his help, I will continue and I will see my children again. I walked here today to tell you all these things the Lord has been showing me the past few days. The Lord has brought you all to want to Kia to do his work and you must finish it. Even if disaster come upon you, you must continue to do the Lord's work. What impacts me about the story is Jason's testimony, his faith, his steadfastness in the face of immense trial, things that I hope I will never have to understand. And after heartbreak, his heart is to encourage his brothers in the Lord, missionaries from America, to just keep going. See, Jason suffers, but he is suffering with Christ. And he sees it as worth it. He sees it as his responsibility to bring Christ to Asiana. And he's committed to seeing the gospel transform his people he lives and he chooses to live in the richness of walking with Christ. I want to say, I tell that story, and I need to say that danger is a reality no matter where we are. And we will, there is a real risk for missionaries, but we will take care of our families and we will take precautions and follow protocol. Yet we'll persevere in hope even when bad things happen because it's worth it. Jesus is worth it. So when we began our church planning training, we were told this quote, what you celebrate, you become. See, when we celebrate people maturing in their walks with the Lord, that is where our focus will be. And there is a lot in the Christian life worth celebrating. And for our family, we hope to celebrate one day the birth of an infant church and the translation of a New Testament in a previously unwritten language. And these things are great and important to celebrate, but if that is where the only things we celebrate, that is where we'll put all our focus. So people knowing Christ's love tangibly in their life, that is worth celebrating. And see, it's easy to celebrate things like a Bible translation because it's physical and it's measurable and tangible. And seeing people come to maturity in Christ, it isn't always measurable and often it is very messy. But it is worth it when someone shows the life of Christ. So I want to invite you all to continue to make it your goal in life to see others walk in the fullness of Christ, in your family, in your church, in Paris and in Texas, and even in Papua New Guinea. So as believers, our heartbeat ought to be maturing in Christ. So let's celebrate knowing him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your truth and your word that we can live in it and walk in it. May we know you, God, May we know you deeply and tangibly. And God, I pray for those who do not know you yet that you would continue to send those into the harvest. We trust you. In your name, amen. I'm going to have them both stay up here. We're going to pray over them. And I want to encourage you, their kids are over in kids ministry this service. But uh, as we pray over them, I want to encourage you to ask the Lord if he would have you to partner with them uh, financially to support them and what they are doing. 
I know for a lot of us in this room going overseas and things like that, there are people that I believe are called specifically to that, but we're all called to be on mission. And so we can be the hands and feet of Jesus there by supporting people that God has called and sending there in the flesh. And so I would encourage you after this service, they're going to be back here at the back. And if you feel led to do that, you can go back there and talk to them and check out their stuff. But uh, as a church, as most of you know, every single year uh, we have a percentage that we set aside as kind of a baseline that we give away and we want to sow seed into ministries and organizations that are that are doing kingdom work and uh, that we believe in. And whenever we sat down as elders back in November and again in December, and we were talking about what, where is God leading us to give as a church and, and what is he saying? Uh, we came across this ministry and we came across you guys and unanimously felt like even before we ever met you and, and uh, we just kind of figured out what it was that you were doing. And we, we just knew we believed in it. And uh, so as a church, we are partnering with them uh, for a $10,000 gift to help you guys and be a blessing to you guys. And so we just want you to know that we believe in you and we're behind you. We're supporting you. And I believe there are going to be others just individually that are going to be supporting you as well um, as you go and, and reach people that have not been reached, reach people that don't even, may not even know who Jesus is and even heard that name before, or obviously, I mean, we take for granted the fact that we have three Bibles sitting in our house and there are people all around the world that don't even have a written language to know the word of God. And so we believe in what you're doing. And if you will just stretch your hand out, we're going to pray over them and just pray God's blessing on them as we end today. Lord, we just thank you. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to, to hear about what you're doing in others' lives and around the world. And God, we want to be a part of what it is that you are doing. Lord, I pray that we would get out of our own way so that we can be a part of your mission and your calling and what it is that you're doing and furthering the kingdom of God and seeing people come to maturity in Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for this couple. We thank you for this family that you have put this specific calling on their life to go and to move their family and to invest and sow. And, and Lord, we just believe right now that there's going to be a, a, a huge harvest that is going to be reaped because of what is being sown. All of the training, all of the prayer, all of the preparation, all of the raising funds, all of the things, Lord, that, that you have already gone before them, that your blessing is on them, your favor is on them. God, I speak prosperity and health and life over their family and everything that they do. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, can we give him a hand once again? Thank you, guys. We love y'all. We're going to sing. Will you stand to your feet today? We're going to sing this final song and just go out of here uh, just in an attitude of worship. And uh, I want to say this, too. It's because of your generosity. I know we say it, you know, every, every so often, but it's because of your generosity that as a church we're able to do uh, what we're able to do and, and sow seed into uh, people's lives and different ministries and things like that that are going beyond what we can accomplish right here in these four walls or even in this community or in this state that God is doing something all around the world and we want to be a part of it and so we just want to say thank you on behalf of my wife and the elders and just you guys are so generous and and uh, we're able to be a blessing as the Lord leads uh, because of your generosity and so uh, I just want to encourage you to Ask the Lord during this last song, just ask the Holy Spirit, is, would this be something that you would have me to partner with them, even individually for our family? Uh, is there something you want me to sow into this? Do you want me to become like a monthly partner? You can talk to them back at the back on your way out today and uh, get all of that uh, organized with them. But Lord, we just thank you today for the opportunity to gather together and to hear your word and the opportunity to partner with people that are that are doing your work and that are called by you and God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today, that we would uh, that we would make a decision, as we talked about just a few weeks ago, that, that we would decide in our hearts, what is it that you would have us to do? What is it that you would have us to do in this moment, in this situation, with this family, and this calling, uh, what you're doing in this part of the world? God, we thank you for it. And as we sing this song, just speak to us, and we'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory in everything we do. We worship you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.